It was really a wow moment. There was liquid water elsewhere in the solar system. We had been right. You have all of the ingredients that you need that we know of to develop life as we know it. We have planted the tower and the Cassini spacecraft is on its way to Saturn. So these sort of hard cases, these James Bond looking cases, uh, used to transport the flight hardware. This is one of the magnetometer sensors. Uh, that I worked on, and it will have been integrated onto the boom that came out from the side of the spacecraft. And here's part of the magnetometer instrument, and here's the other half of the magnetometer instrument. This is a quarter size model, so this is a quarter size me. Um, I'd like to be this weight, not this height. She was one of the best things about the Cassini mission because I spoke to her on the phone every couple of days for years and years and years. So a gas giant like Saturn is incredibly mysterious. Saturn just captivates people because it looks so supernatural. It engenders the immediate feeling that it can't possibly be real. It has no solid surface and it has rings around it and we don't necessarily know where those rings came from or how old they are. These, as you can see, are spiky shadows that are created by these features here that are sticking up two and a half miles. Having the perspective of Cassini to be able to see that was one of the most extraordinary things, I think, about the images that came back. It was just extraordinary. It was out of science fiction. Some of the most amazing discoveries that Cassini made were about Saturn's moons. The first flyby of Enceladus was not terribly close, but something funny was happening in the magnetometer data. Okay, so... Put it into slideshow. My boss came to the team and said, You can see there's a little pimple in the data just over there. This looks intriguing. This is not what we're, we expect. We expect on a rocky moon for the magnetic field to drape over it, a bit like a, a nice peaceful curtain draping over a window that's not moving. And instead, it looks like there's some sort of breeze gently fluttering that curtain. And what we were able to do is calculate what ions were generating those waves, and it was water group ions. So Michelle decided, after discussions with all of us, that she would go to the Jet Propulsion Lab and she would propose moving the next flyby of Enceladus, which wasn't for some time to come, to much sooner. And this was a huge risk for her. We knew for us to be able to have a chance of really seeing what was going on at Enceladus, we needed to get closer. The principal investigator of the magnetometer, God bless her, she went into action and convinced the project to take the spacecraft close to the South Pole so we could all get a better look. And I must confess, I didn't sleep for two or three nights before that close flyby, because if we hadn't seen anything, no one would ever have believed anything I said again. So, but what we found was spectacular. This image made me nearly fall off my chair because here we see dozens of jets, big and small, coming off the South Polar region. It was fantastic. It was really a wow sort of a moment. There was liquid water elsewhere in the solar system other than the Earth. Enceladus, tiny rocky moon of Saturn, is geologically active a stable liquid environment, organic material, and contact with rock, you have all of the ingredients that you need that we know of to develop life as we know it. I love this picture, and it's about as much meaning as you can get out of the, the Cassini mission, because we know that, that 
moon has a, an ocean in it that could harbor life. One of the mysteries of Saturn originally was the source of the rings, and it turns out that Enceladus's geysers feed the very faint but very wide E-ring. It shouldn't be surprising that we found such interesting geological activity on a planet with 82 moons. Ironically, all these wonderful discoveries that we made meant you run out of fuel. It was on 1%, it had an empty tank, so we had to crash it into the planet and let it go. This is the start of the end of the mission. We're running out of fuel and we're going to make sure we go out with as much great science as we can. We want to see how much of the atmosphere we can see before we lose the signal, before it can't fight the atmosphere anymore and it goes off point. These last grand finale orbits where Cassini dove between the rings and the planet, they were never foreseen in the original mission planning. Actually getting to do that was, was really remarkable, take these, these, these kind of dangerous dives between the rings and the planet to see what that space was like. Uh, actually, with the spacecraft physically being there was really remarkable. In some ways, I just want it to be over now. You know, you're sort of waiting for it to end and, and, it, and it's really weird. Quite a lot of us were gathered round, tensely waiting for the data to come back. We were relying on the commands that we had written and we had sent to the spacecraft to have worked properly and for the spacecraft to continue to be able to talk to us right up to the very last minute. I can confirm science playback is locked. And, and then it'll go away. It just will lose the signal and that'll be end of mission. Cross for zero time. That would be the end of the spacecraft. Project manager off the net. It doesn't feel a long way away, actually, because every time I watch it, I am immediately there again. So that, that I think, I guess, says something about the, the, the impact that, that the end of mission had. That was a great spacecraft. It did exactly what we asked it to do, all the way to the end. When you have checked, on a spacecraft every day for more than a decade and then suddenly it's not there. It really is a wrench, it's, it's a blow and you feel sadness and, and a certain amount of grief. Godspeed, think it and release it.